Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Sandy Ray Sims, and I'm the Secretary Treasurer of the Napa County Historical Society. This evening, we are very fortunate to have Dave Puda here joining us from San Diego, where it is not raining, and no, you cannot take it with you. Um, Dan is a certified sommelier, a Napa Valley wine expert, a Bordeaux master, a champagne master, among other things. And he also is very knowledgeable about cheese, one of my favorite subjects. He's traveled the world, um, exploring the different regions and learning all about different wines. And he's taught mm -hmm. wine appreciation at San Diego, the, uh, San Diego State University, Cal State San Marcos, and Miraco uh, Miracosta College. And he is a member of the Guild of Sommeliers. So I think we're very, very fortunate to have Dane with us tonight. And I hope you'll all enjoy it. Um, if you have a little minute here, we'd like to show you a little video tells you a little bit more this, about the society. Hi, my name is Danielle Barreca with the Napa County Historic Society Board of Directors. Thank you for tuning in today. It is because of the support of members like you that we are able to still provide content during this challenging time. Please consider renewing your membership or gifting a membership to a friend or family member. Thank you, and we hope you tune in again. Hi, my name is Danielle Barreca Sorry. with the Napa County Historical Society. Okay. She's still Danielle Barreca. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she hasn't changed. <laughs> Not a bit. And um, now, Dane, please tell us, interest us as we're already interested. Great, well, thank you. It's very great to be here. Thank you so much to the Napa County Historical Society. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. And Kelly, can you see that okay now? Looks great. Great, so yeah, my name is Dane. I am a level two certified sommelier, Italian wine professional. I hold a certification called Napa Valley Wine Expert from the Wine Scholars Guild. I am a, considered a Bordeaux master. And I am also a certified level two member of the Academy of Cheese. What that means is I've passed two certification tests related to cheese. Uh, I live here in the San Diego region. I'm an experienced wine educator at Miracosta College, our local junior college. I've taught at San Diego State University and Cal State San Marcos. And my last name is Kuta. And I have a brand, my brand name is Kudasam. So you can check me out on Instagram, send me an email. I have a website, even a storefront. So yeah, that's a little bit about me. So the Napa County Historical Society asked me to say a few words about what, kind of what drew me to be a Psalm, to work in the business of wine. Well, I think it boils down to three things. First of all, about seven or eight years ago, I took a wine appreciation course at our local junior college here in San Diego. And I, it's really opened my eyes. It was, it was a six week course. We tasted, you know, 40, 40 to 50 different wines. And it really opened my, my, my eyes, my nose, my palate into the wine world. And it really got me interested. Uh, secondly, I stumbled upon a book called Cork Dork. I forget the author, but the author was a journalist who quit her job. And she uh, took 12 months to become a level two certified SOM, which is kind of the industry standard in the sommelier world. And she you knows it was about her trials and tribulations. And it was very interesting to me that reading that book is like, oh, this is really cool. This kind of business, the, the, the culture they have and, and all this. And then also I stumbled upon a movie on Netflix called Som, S-O-M-M, -M, which was a documentary about four or five people that decided to try for the level four master Som, which is very intense. Like only a few hundred people in the world have attained that. And it's a very entertaining documentary about the whole wine world. So I, after I saw those, or experienced those three, those three uh, things I described, I was like, you know, maybe I should try this myself. So I jumped in, got some certifications, took about nine months to get my level two SOM certification. And then I went back to the junior college I attended a few years before, and they were looking, happened to be looking for an instructor. And what do you know about Three months later, I became the instructor of the same class that I sat in about three years before that. And now I am, a, you know, like I said, instructor at many colleges here in the San Diego region. So, so yeah, that's kind of what drew me to the world. So uh, tonight I have a topic to discuss and it is 
luminaries, wine luminaries from past to present. So I'd like to start first with a little bit of background on Napa Valley wine. So we'll click through some slides here about the background. So you might know this, maybe not, but Napa Valley represents 0.4% of the world's wine production. So it's, it's really small. It's not a very large region. The Napa's production is even tiny compared to other famous wine regions. It's 0.4 of the world's wine, but let's bring up a chart here and look at some other famous wine regions like Mendoza, Bordeaux. In terms of vineyard acreage, these, these areas are large, very large. Napa is really small, about 46,000 acres planted to the vine. So in comparison, you know, it's, it's pretty small, but yet it is world renowned. So we're going to talk about how it became that way and, you know, the luminaries that helped that along. Just so you're aware, Napa Valley's top varietals, it's pretty much all Cab and Chardonnay that kind of lead the way, a little bit of Merlot and some other varietals, but Cabernet and Chardonnay really, really lead the pack in terms of the fine wine world. And then here we have a little map of Napa Valley. And as you might know, it's a, Napa Valley itself is an Appalachian. And inside there are 16 other nested Appalachians called American Viticultural Areas that the US government uh, demarcates in terms of specific wine growing regions. Um, and that Napa Valley Appalachian was actually granted uh, second in the US. The first Appalachian in 1981 was granted in, in Missouri. And a few months later, Napa Valley was the second Appalachian, but it was the first in California. So it's uh, pretty interesting. And the Napa Valley Appalachian is actually a part of a larger Appalachian called the North Coast Appalachian. So yeah, the valley is about 30 miles long. It runs from elevation from about sea level to about 2,600 feet. But yeah, so let's, let's go back and see where it all started. So let's talk about the California luminaries. Let's talk about the beginnings. So in the beginning, Father Junipero Serra is credited with planting California's first vineyard in San Diego in 1769 after the founding of Mission Basilica San Diego de Acala. And I couldn't find any great pictures of Father Junipero Serra, so I went to a, a website called Fiverr, and someone drew this nice pencil drawing for $5 for me. So it's a great, uh, great little investment I made for that. Um, so he planted the European varietal called Vitis vinifera, got the cuttings of the Lisan Prieto varietal. Today, we commonly know this as the Mission grape. So that's kind of what they planted back then. We don't have a lot of that today, but back in that day, they planted the Mission varietal. The Mission nickname, what we call it today, kind of honors the Padres uh, planting their vineyards at almost all, I think nearly all of California's 21 missions that were established in the late 1700s and early 1800s. Like I said, today, the Mission varietal is considered somewhat of a bland and kind of un uninteresting grape. In terms, at least in terms of the fine wine world, but it was just fine for their sacramental purposes, you know, with the friars back back in the day. Next, let's move on to Jean Louis Vignes, as we pronounce it today, the in Los Angeles. Um, he planted the first non-emission European grape varietals in the state in Los Angeles in 19, 1833. He's French, so the French pronunciation is usually something like Vignes. But uh, today in California, we have a street named after him, actually near Union Station. Named, and they pronounce it Vignes Street. Uh, he was a French settler. He became the first commercial winemaker in California. But then the story kind of moves to Napa Valley. A few years later, after Vignes began planting his grape varietals in Los Angeles, George Yount became the first permanent European settler in Napa Valley. And this came in the early 1800s. And they say he planted vineyards as early as 1838. Just like the Franciscan Padres, Yount planted the Mission varietal. The vines, they say, uh, he, he sourced them from the Sonoma Mission, not too far away. And it would really take about 10 years for the, the European-style Vitis Vinifera vine to come over to Napa Valley. He was still using the Mission varietal. In fact, the town of Napa, the Napa Valley town of Yountville is named after George Yount. You pull up a map here, you know, Yountville, Yountville is kind of right in the center of the valley. Some say Yountville, the Yountville Appalachian is more famous for its restaurants than its grapes because it's the home of the French Laundry, and some other great restaurants, but yeah. So let's move on to next Next up kind of in the famous luminaries was Charles Krug. So German, German boar Charles Krug arrived in Napa in 1860. He founded the St. Helena Winery in 1861. And although not Napa's first winery, Krug soon became the most successful operation in Napa because Charles really understood public relations well. Right In 1882, he opened Napa's first tasting room where you could actually stop in and taste wine. 
He often shared his information with his competitors about how he's doing, how he's growing wine, you know, the tasting room operations, kind of for the betterment of all Napa Valley producers. In fact, some they started calling him the father of Napa wine because of his kind of fatherly guidance. So it was pretty interesting in that regard as well. In 1943, the Mondavi family purchased Charles Krug, and we'll talk a little bit more about Mondavi a bit later. Next up is Jacob Schramm. He came next and he really led the charge to seek out and cultivate the, the better European cuttings from Vitis vinifera and kind of steered away from the mission varietal. Another German Im immigrant, Schramm was born in the Rheinhesse district of Germany, which is also a, a wine region as well. In 1862, he brought and cleared out, bought and cleared out a wooded hillside just west of Calistoga. And today we call that area Diamond Mountain. What he did was Shram actually built elaborate caves and tunnels into the hillside for wine aging, and wine aging and storage. And what he did was he hired a team of 12 Chinese workers and they dug a mile and a half of caves. It took those workers 17 years to dig a mile and a half of caves because they say they only made a progress of six inches per day, which is astounding. In 1875, he built a victorious Victorian style mansion Business continued to thrive into the 1900s. Unfortunately, he passed away in early 1905. The winery kind of fell out of favor and actually ceased operations for a few, a few years. Kind of stayed that way until 1965 when it was purchased by the Davies family. And what they did, they kind of changed the game a little bit. They changed the focus to sparkling wine. They opened the tours. They opened the expansive caves to tours for the public. In the, they opened up the mansion so the public could visit. They actually built a modern business visitor center. All this really brought back Schramsberg to a successful institution. In fact, the, the one of the best wines, the Schramsberg Blanc de Blancs, is known as one of the world's greatest sparkling wines. I mean, it's, it's up there with champagne, and it's been served at all, starting at President Nixon's 1972 Toast to Peace with China's Premier Zhao. It's been served at presidential events ever since Nixon, including up until uh, including Obama, uh, including Biden, actually re recent ha recently had an event where Blanc de Blancs was served. So all the presidents from Nixon on served Stramsburg Blancs de Blancs. Next influential, influential Napa Valley luminary arrived in 1868, Jacob Berenger. He was another German immigrant. He worked as a cellar foreman for Charles Krug until 1875, when Jacob and his brother Frederick partnered to purchase land right next door to Krug. And like Schramm, Berenger Brothers also dug long winding tunnels into the hillside to store wine for aging. In 1883, they built what is now known as the Rhine House. Today, it's a state historic landmark. Both Berenger Brothers passed away in the first decade or so of the 20th, 20th century, and Jacob's children actually took ownership of the Berenger Winery. Charles and Bertha Berenger were able to keep the winery open during the prohibition years. And what they did, did was they obtained a federal license that allowed them to legally make wine for religious purposes, as did a few other wineries in the valley. And after prohibition, Behringer was the first winery to offer public tours. And people literally lined up outside to get a tasting. This is a famous photo of the first day the Behringer winery was open after prohibition was repealed. Today, Behringer, of course, is one of the top Napa Valley producers. And yeah, so Behringer had a real big impact on the valley. Next up, we have Gustav Niebaum, a Finnish sea captain. He made his fortune trading fur hides and running trade posts in the Alaska Territory. Um, upon retirement from his career in commerce, he followed his dream of making wine, and he established what is now known as the Inglenook Winery, built in 1879. Uh, he Niebaum slowly grew his holdings by buying up small parcels of land, and by 1887, he owned 1,100 contiguous acres of land. In 1881, he began, began constructing with a chateau style building that you see here, modeled after the famous chateaus of France. He had many firsts, right? Niebaum was one of the first to plant Cabernet Sauvignon vines from European vine cuttings. He was the first Napa Valley producer to sell his wine in 750 milliliter bottles instead of the normal 225 liter barrels. Niebaum was the first, one of the first to use vintage dates for his wines. And he really actively promoted putting Napa Valley on the wine labels to really bring Napa Valley to the forefront. After he died, Niebaum's nephew took over, but prohibition really hurt this winery. They, you know, they stayed open, but 
it really hurt their their overall bottom line. And they, you know, but just by selling grapes to Sacramento purposes, really didn't do that much for the winery. But after Prohibition, they kind of restarted their full operation, and they got help from Carl Bunshu over in Sonoma, famous uh, owner of Bun uh, Gunlock Bunshu. He actually helped them. So in the 1930s, right after Prohibition, I've mentioned that a lot. That's kind of what turned the Napa Valley production of wine around. So in the 1930s, there were only six premier wineries in Napa Valley. We had Behringer Brothers, we had Bolayu, Lark Mead, Luis Martini, the Christian Brothers, and Inglenook. So let's talk a little bit about Inglenook. 1964, Inglenook sold to United Vintners, a large corporation today. United Vintners is Constellation brand. In the years that followed, uh, quality kind of began to wane. And then Inglenook, then the story gets kind of interesting. In 1975, part of Inglenook, not the Chateau part, but some vineyards were sold to a young Hollywood talent named Francis Ford Coppola. Coppola used his earnings from a certain 1972 movie to make this purchase. And here's a little clip of that movie. Come out, though. Of course, we all know that movie is The Godfather. So from the proceeds of The Godfather, he was able to purchase part of Inglenook. Story, story moves on. In 1992, he made another certain film, one of his highest grossing films of all time, winner of three Academy Awards. And this film was Dracula, Bram Stoker's Dracula. Using the profits from this film, Coppola bought the remaining pieces of Inglenook, including the historic Chateau building. Now we kind of had everything. He made some other smart moves. Coppola moved his lower tier brands to a new Sonoma location in Ale Alexander Valley. If you haven't been there, I highly recommend it. It's a really cool uh, family oriented, but it's kind of a lower tier brand. He really focused the Napa operation on top tier quality wines. In fact, he named his top tier wine Rubicon. He bought the rights to the name Inglenook. And today the Inglenook's Rubicon has a very solid reputation as one of the premier Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon wines around. So kind of the early Napa Valley luminaires can be broken down into, I had my friend also made another drawing for me. In summary, we have Yount, Krug, Schramm, Behringer, Niebaum. You know, they kind of play the most important roles. Many other operations were established in this era, but those five were really the top producers and settlers that really pushed Napa Valley forward in the early years. So now I want to move on to kind of the modern era. So let's move on to California luminaries in the modern era. And let's talk about Robert Mondavi. This is a very interesting story. So Robert Mondavi was not a pioneer in making fine wine in Napa Valley. He wasn't really a winemaker. What he did was promote and market around the world that California could really make quality wine, right? He became basically the spokesman for Napa Valley in the early 60s and 70s. He's a pioneer, trailblazer, trendsetter. He really set the pace for notoriety and the real ascent of California wine. Robert Parker, famous wine writer, founder of various magazines, summed it up perfectly when he said, no one in the, in the United States has done more to promote the image of fine wine than Robert Mondavi and his family. They have had a profound positive impact on American culture, and we all benefit from it, benefited from it. So we really brought up, brought California wine to the forefront, especially Napa Valley. So let's go back and how, you know, figure out how this happened. So let's go back to 1906. Caesar and Rosa Mondavi immigrated from Italy to America, 1906. Initially, they moved to Minnesota. They later settled in California's Central Valley near the town of Lodi. Robert actually went to Standard, Stanford University. He graduated. He encouraged his, once he graduated, Robert and he encouraged his brother Peter and father Caesar to all partner together and purchase the Charles, Charles Krug right away, which was happening, which is ha happened to be at, for sale in Napa's St. Helena region. So the three of them got together in a, a three way partnership, but things began to sour pretty much almost immediately. Peter was the winemaker. He took the lead as the primary winemaker, which fit perfectly with his kind of introverted, introverted personality. Robert was more of an extrovert. He was the salesman and spent most of his time on the road selling and promoting the family's wine. Caesar acted kind of as the patriarch. While resentment between the brothers quickly built up, 
as Robert would come home from these long, lavish trips and share stories and meeting dignitaries, uh, having luxurious dinner parties. And then Robert would kind of direct Peter on how to make wine, saying that, hey, he knew what the customer wanted, right? Robert pushed for innovative changes at the time, but Peter wasn't quite open to, such as Robert wanted to use glass lined tanks instead of stainless steel. Robert really pushed fermenting and closed top tanks. Uh, Robert wanted to replace the large redwood aging barrels with smaller French oak barrels. And he wanted to replant the vineyards with more popular varietals. But Peter didn't really, really want to do that. Peter was like, wait, I'm the winemaker. He didn't want advice from his brother. He just wanted to make wine kind of his way. Well, the quarreling brothers continued to bicker, but they're always held at bay by Caesar. Then in 1959, Caesar passed away and Rosa became the peacemaker, but she could not really exert the control that Caesar had. It really kind of blew up into a fist fight a short time later. So as the story goes, in 1963, Robert had received an invitation to a White House dinner with President Kennedy. So Robert took his wife, Marjorie, shopping to prepare for this dinner, and they decided on an expensive mink coat for Marjorie to wear to the dinner. It was $5,000, so they decided not to buy it. However, shortly thereafter, the coat went on sale and Robert snapped it up for only $2,500. And he put this $2,500 on the company's expense account. You can find anything on YouTube. You know, I just found a, this is not actually Marjorie. It's not actually Robert Mondavi. It's just a uh, bland YouTube clip of someone trying out a mint coat in the 1950s. So when Peter had heard about this, this expense, he, he was furious, right? Not only had his, had his brother's wife received a $2,500 mink coat, compliments to the family business, Peter had not been invited to the White House dinner with the president. Only Robert and Marjorie's names were on the invite. White House dinner was postponed, but Peter still held that grudge. At a family dinner two years later, the mink coat issue came up again. And the brothers actually it led the brothers to exchanging swings, kind of like a baseball brawl. And he's drilled, and Manny's going after him. And here we go. And Manny and Ventura are going at it on the mound. Okay, enough of that. I think you get the idea. So Robert walked out. Peter and Rosa fired him from the company, and Robert vowed revenge. Just over a year later, Robert established his own winery in Oakville. He first borrowed some money to purchase part of the famous Tokalan Vineyard. Next, he borrowed even more money and he hired renowned designer and architect Clifford May to build a grand mission style winery, which became one of the grandest structures in the valley. He actually put it right along the highway so everyone could see it. He placed the building unusually close to Highway 29, which is, you know, the, as everyone knows, the main artery of Napa Valley. He hired Warren Winiarski to make wine Winiarski would later move on and create Stag's Leap's wine cellar's famous Cabernet Sauvignon that won the 1976 Judgment of Paris tasting. It was only the best for Robert Mondavi, right? The Robert Mondavi winery would, winery would focus only on premium wines. Interestingly, the first vintage um, was made only using the best equipment because Robert wanted really the, high, the highest quality wine and used all the latest technology. But they actually started their first vintage before the rooftops were even on the building. The crush, the fermentation, and the racking were all performed in the open air. Pretty interesting, pretty innovative at the time. Mondavi's done up, made many other innovations. For example, for example, the Mondavi Corporation hired famous artists. Here is a watercolor of the Robert Mondavi Winery by artist Will Freeborn, one of Scotland's most famous artists, which began appearing on labels in 2015. Robert did also did some other kind of unexpected things. First, he changed the pronunciation of his name to from Mondavi to Mondavi. So originally the family was called Mondavi, but he changed it to Mondavi. This was to differentiate himself from his brother Peter and mother Rosa. Next up, he sued Peter and Rosa. He sued his mom and his brother. Can you believe that? There are other noteworthy milestones during Robert Mondavi's tenure as the kind of the king of California wine. He was one of the first uh, to vineyard designate his wines, such as the Tokalan vineyard that I mentioned earlier. Mondavi pretty much invented the Fumé Blanc style of Sauvignon Blanc, 
that's kind of an interesting story. What he did, what he did there was his Sauvignon Blanc wasn't selling that well. So he wanted to kind of create a new, new angle, a new marketing angle, maybe create a, do, do something for the wine. So he was really a fan of the Sancerre Pouille Fumé, which is a Sancerre, which is a Sauvignon Blanc from the French region of Sancerre. And sometimes there are these little bit of oak in the wine. So he, he decided to use the same style. He oaked his Sauvignon Blancs just a little bit, and he changed the name from Sauvignon Blanc to Fumé Blanc, put that on the label. The American public is like, oh, what is this? This is a fantastic tasting wine, a little bit different than a normal Sauvignon Blanc we get from the Valley, and it has a new name. Well, the sales soared. It was a tremendous success, and others followed. Soon other producers in California began oaking their Sauvignon Blancs and naming their Sauvignon Blancs Fumé Blancs. He partnered with French, uh, famous French winemakers to establish an entirely new winery called Opus One. Partnered, partnered with the Rothschilds from the Bordeaux region of France. And they used vines from the, they used uh, grapes from the Tocolan vineyard to make their famous Opus One. So he's done many other, many other uh, interesting things that really pushed winemaking forward. The rest of the Mondavi tale is kind of rife with lawsuits and countersuits and court proceedings, power struggles. He had a lot of money problems. It's all told in the book, The House of Mondavi, The Rise and Fall of the American of an American Wine Dynasty by Julia Flynn Seiler. Ultimately, Robert kind of lost face after a hostile takeover by the Constellation brand of New York, which eventually forced him out of his own company. In 2008, Robert died, no longer owning or having anything to do with the Robert Mondavi Winery. A little bit of a, a sad tale there. And by the way, Marjorie never got to wear her mink coat to the White House. Why was that? The dinner party that was canceled was canceled because President Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, Texas in November, 1963. All right, so Mondavi, so let's, uh, now let's move to some new kids on the block. So who are the new kids kind of coming up and coming here in the Valley? Well, of course there are a lot. We will, you know, hindsight's always 2020, so we won't know who the really successful entrepreneurs and winemakers are in the valley until we look back on it 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now. But in my opinion, there are some interesting personalities. So new kids on the block. First we have, here it comes up, oops, Dario Satui. Well, so he's interesting. He took 14 years to construct an authentic 13th century Tuscan castle in Napa Valley and named it Castello de Almarosa. It even has a medieval torture chamber in the basement. He runs tours and it's this incredible structure, very unique and yeah, very, very interesting player in the Napa Valley wine world. Dario Satui. Next up we have Donald Hess. Donald Hess founded the Hess Collection, now part of Hess Person in the Mount Veeder area of Napa Valley. Uh, fantastic wines, but what really sets it apart, Donald Hess and the Hess Collection have one of Napa Valley's best contemporary art museums. Large gallery in the second, third, and fourth floors of their, of their winemaking operation. You know, it's contemporary, to contemporary art. Here's a short video of my son, a few visits ago when we are visiting the contemporary art. He was fascinated by these statues that had no heads, so he wanted to to be like them too. <laughs> so very new to the region, uh, Cliff Lede. So he had his actually first plantings in the area in 2002. And he's interesting because Cliff Lede names his vineyards after classic rock songs and rock albums. He has the Dark Side of the Moon vineyard named after the famous Pink Floyd album. He even has a Light My Fire vineyard. He was a big Doors fan. So his wines are spectacular, but it kind of takes kind of a rock and roll approach to making his wines, similar to Charles Smith in Washington State. He does the same kind of thing with his labeling and his wine and his promotion, marketing. So Cliff Lede, kind of a, the rock and roller of Napa Valley. And then we have Kathy Corison, one of the first female winemakers in Napa Valley. Kathy Corison, I have a photo here. She was a graduate of UC Davis's enology program. Uh, the Corson and Cabernet Sauvignon collection wines are some of Napa's most powerful and respected wines, in my opinion. 
Um, yeah, there are many, many other Napa Valley luminaries and uh, new kids on the block. So yeah, that, that about is about all the material I had prepared for tonight. So maybe now we open it up for questions. But the history of Napa Valley or anything about the luminaries that I mentioned. Jane, thank you so much. So I, one question that comes to mind is that, uh, you know, areas in France are known, you know, they're called, I mean, wines are literally called by the region, like you said, you mm -hmm. Saint-Cyr and, you know, the Loire Valley is really famous for its fumé. Um, but here in this valley, in the Napa Valley, we really are, I guess, most famous for our cabs. And, and could you maybe do you and you may not know but why do you think that one per particular varietal really took hold here versus something else you know a pinot or something else that could have easily is taken a hold here as well so what do you think yeah so the yeah that's, that's a very good, good good question why is cabernet so so prominent well it kind of goes back you know the prohibition era in the 20s and 30s really, really hit Napa Valley hard. You know, very few wineries stayed open. A few, like I mentioned, Behringer stayed open for sacramental purposes. But then following that, uh, following Prohibition, we had World War II. In the early 50s, production really took off. Demand really started to, to climb. You know, World War II was over. The country's happy. Demand started to increase. So a lot, a lot of growers flocked to Napa Valley and started planting everything they could, anything they could just to make money because the man was so high. They were planting anything they could. Um, and that lasted in the 60s and 70s. And then in about 1980, this bug called phylloxera reappeared. It had first appeared in the late 1800s, but it came back in the, in the early 1980s. What phylloxera does, phylloxera is this louse and it attacks the grapevines, actually in the roots, it's subterranean, and it kills the vines. So what the, what the rush to plant at, in the 1950s and 60s they actually used the incorrect rootstock. They didn't use a rootstock that was resistant to phylloxera. They used a different one because it was easier to maintain, easier to plant, get, it, get their operation started quicker, make more money quicker. So they planted kind of in, they planted what's called AXR1, which was a, non phylloxera resistant rootstock. Well, the, one of the big floods of the 1980s kind of flooded the, the, uh, the valley and spread phylloxera all throughout the valley and really destroyed a lot of the vineyards. So what the producers did in the early 80s, this was just after the 1976 judgment of Paris, keep in mind, in the early 80s, they ripped up all of the vineyards and decided to plant the best varietals. So producers actually answered the question, what varietal is gonna do best? Instead of how can I make the most money? What's the quickest to get going? What varietal does best in the soils, the climate, the terroir? What's going to do the best? And they decided Cabernet. So they started to replant the, the vineyards to Cabernet. And then I believe in 1992 is when Cabernet overtook Chardonnay as Napa's number one varietal planted. So it was really a combination of, of history and a lot of things, but really the phylloxera that forced vineyards to, forced uh, winemakers to rip out old vines and plant the vines that do best in the weather and the soil, which happens to be Cabernet Sauvignon. Great, thank you, thank you. Sort of, sort of an aside, uh, this is Shannon, hi. Yeah. Uh, an aside, since you were mentioning Kathy Corazon, um, I happened to learn recently that this year was the 50th harvest from their Kronos vineyard, which is their, um, their, their main, uh, uh, vineyard designation for, for their, uh, lead Cabernet. 50 years. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, I believe you pronounce your name Tyson, Tyson, T-Y-C-K. Uh, Josephine Tixon. Tixon. It's, it rhymes with Dixon. Dixon. Well, thank you. Thank you. That, um, and, you know, she was really the very first, uh, female vintner in the valley um, and that's kind of really cool that we go way back as having women vintners in the valley I don't think we tell that story often enough not that we want to take away anything from Kathy Corson because she's just done such remarkable stuff but I think that um, now you talk about the new kids on the block we have Kathy we have 
Paula Cornell, who's come back with a sh her champagnes now that you know speak to generations, and um, it's all very cool here in the valley what we've got going now. <laughs> when we counted up out of the 53 wineries on exhibit right now, almost half of them are the vintner, the the winemaker is a woman. Wow. So that's it, fantastic. Yes, yeah, it shows that kind of remarkable change in 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 this in this whole thing. So. Um, any other questions that we have? Max. Thank you. Yeah, um, this is a little off topic, I think, but um, yeah. I'm new back to uh, the area. I grew up here, but I've been away for 40 years and now I'm back for two months, three months now. And I've seen this winery up the Highway 29. You may not know anything about it. It's called the Prisoner Wine Company, something like that. Do you know anything yes. about that or? Does yeah, so the Prisoner Wine Company, they're kind of a new operation. They took over the, the it's not a brand new uh, building. They actually took over, they bought the vineyards from, the name escapes me. Um, Shelly, do you know the, the owner prior to Prisoner? Um, I, you know, if, 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 if I had time to think, yes, but right now off the top of my head, yeah. I know exactly where Prisoner is. Yeah, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's at it, Rutherford it, there. Yeah. Was yeah. it or? Was it Swift? Was it Orrin Swift? I don't know. It really no. Is. But it, interestingly, so they're in the wine world. Prisoner is is interesting. So the prisoners kind of they make wine similar in a Camus style. So they actually add a little bit of residual sugar, and their wines end up being a little bit on the not sweet, but higher in, in residual sugar than other wines can be, similar to a Camus style. So they definitely have a particular style they're going for, you know, fruit forward, you know, that slight sweetness. Uh, consumers love it, of course. And what, what one interesting thing they inherited from the previous owner that uh, the name escapes me, they inherited the famous Rutherford Bench Monument. So the Rutherford Bench Monument is this literal like park bench. It's made out of wood. It's kind of large. So it's not like the human size. It's like a giant sized um, park bench. And the Rutherford Bench Monument denotes the famous Rutherford Bench. Uh, Rutherford is an Appalachian in Napa Valley, and the easternmost side is what they call the Rutherford Bench because the alluvi alluvial soils come down from the mountain, and just before they hit the river, it kind of drops off into, you know, like a bench. Well, you would see like a, you know, a, a land-like bench. So the growers there, they plant their vines on top of this, you know, not so good alluvial soil, which makes the vines really struggle and really produces this real concentrated uh, flavors in the grapes a little bit different than the valley floor uh, would. So, you know, the Rutherford bench and the, the bench area land actually extends a little bit further north, a little bit south into Oakville, a little bit forth north into St. Hel Helena, but, you know, 80 to 90 percent of the bench is actually in the area of Rutherford. So because this has this great reputation of the, my grapes come from the Rutherford bench, they had this monument of a giant bench at the Prisoner Wine Company. Well, and also I, I noticed that Shannon here has put that, yeah, it was founded by Dave Finney. He was the founder yeah. of Warren Swift too. Um, it's also, I, the prisoners are in, just as I was thinking about it, it's in the, it's in the original, the older Modoc um, vineyard set um, at Rutherford and it's right next door to Ghost Block. So the Ghost Block. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah. And, oh, and that's exactly <laughs> Thank you, Shannon. That's what I was thinking of. It is. It occupies the old Franciscan. Yeah, Franciscan. Yeah. Franciscan. That's what I. Was yeah, that's what it was. Yes. And Franciscan was known for its. Um, you might remember this, Max, when from when we were young. But they used to produce a bin, so their wine, their red wines were produced in bin numbers, and um, they were completely inconsistent year to year. <laughs> so one year you'd get this bin that you just died for and the next year you'd get a bin you could, you know, you'd make vinegar with. But it was, that was their, their kind of their claim. So we have another question about, um, because you know about cheese as well as wine, mm -hmm. um, in, as we now kind of move into the 21st century and the 20th century and part of Robert Mondavi, quite frankly, his, his big push was to really pair uh, wines with foods, you know, red wine with red meat, white wine with chicken. But in the 21st century, does that still hold true? Or are we starting to move out of, from that? 
Yeah, you know, I think that's a real big general generalization, you know, red wine with meat and white wine with chicken. Um, you, there's definitely some other um, ways to approach a food pairing. Uh, I like to think of it more of an old world, new world kind of scenario instead of white versus red. So, so old world wines, old world meaning continental Europe and new world meaning everywhere else. So continental Europe, of course, is you know, French, uh, France, Italy, Spain, and everywhere else would be Australia, California, uh, South Africa, South America. So old world wines typically have a little bit more acid in them. Not always, but in general, a little bit more acid. They're typically a little bit more delicate, a little bit lower in alcohol, and they typically lead with earth, earthy flavors, um, oakiness, you know, um, turned earth, you know, leather, cigar box, tobacco leaf, tomato, tomatoes, uh, herbal, herbal spices. Where New World wines tend to be a little bit more fruity on top. You know, they lead with more the the red, the black, and the blue fruits. Of course, all wines kind of have all these elements, but old world wines typically be a little bit more higher in acid and a little bit, little bit higher in the earthy elements. And new world wines are definitely, you know, fruitier. Think of the California Zinfandel, which is known as a big fruit bomb. So if you're having like a steak dinner, right? So if you're having a juicy steak, maybe a marbled ribeye, and you take a bite of that, the last thing you want to do is take a bite of a fresh strawberry after that. What you want to do after you take a bite of your ribeye is have a, some grilled, grilled uh, mushrooms, some asparagus, some kind of kind of earthy flavors with that. So old world wines, and because they're high acidity, acidity really makes your mouth water. Old world wines really do better with food. New world wines are typically better kind of on their own. Um, sometimes better like with desserts or chocolates, that sort of thing. But in terms of red versus white, there are a lot of exceptions. For example, in the fine wine world, the common practice is with a roast chicken to have that with a Gamay-based Beaujolais, which is a light red wine. Um, that's a good example. Uh, fish, you could do like a Pinot Noir, a light red uh, Pinot Noir with like a grilled salmon. So those are some interesting pairings as well. So you can, you know, cross um, reds and whites in those kind of manners. And, and then in terms of cheese, let me address cheese. So cheese is interesting because what you really want to do with cheese is what grows together goes together. So if you have Spanish wine, you want to try some Spanish cheese. If you have a French wine, it re goes really well with, with French cheese. So yeah, and of course you want to do the bigger reds with more of the blue cheeses and the the Sauvignon Blancs and the sharper mineral-based white wines with more of the soft cheeses, which do really well uh, with the white wine. So yeah, so keep that in mind too. What grows together goes together when you're pairing cheese and wine. Do you have another question, Max? Just a comment. I just finished A Year in Provence, the book by Peter Moyle. And um, there's, he goes, it's all about food and wine and it doesn't seem to follow any cut out, cut and dried rule, like red yeah. with this and that. It's more like everybody has their own take on it. Everybody who's producing the wine and says, you know, eat, you know, have this with this and have that with that. And it's very individualized. And it's really very interesting. If you ever want to explore that, uh, that's a good book to to read about, <laughs> read up on it. And if you haven't read it, but uh, cause it's pretty humorous too. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, we also have Shannon says, I flew United Domestic a couple of weeks ago and they were serving only South African wines on, <laughs> on that flight, so. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very good presentation. Yeah, Dane, this was Thank a you. killer presentation. I'm so glad we have it recorded. This, um, there are gonna be a lot of people watching this afterwards, I'm confident of, because it's just been so good. and. In some ways, it's nice because we've had the chance to really ask you questions. We've really had better questions yeah. tonight than we've had in quite some time. So that's great to see. Um, and I just am, am so grateful that you agreed to speak tonight with um, for our, our group. And uh, we wish you all the best. And we hope you come yeah. see us and come see the exhibit soon. So. Definitely. Well, thank you very much for having me. And thank you. Yeah, I had a wonderful time.